F-Zero is known as the fastest and most extreme race in the known universe. This is a short excerpt from the F-Zero GX game manual on page 6 describing the series, and it's a quote that I truly believe encapsulates F-Zero's brilliant yet tragically short life. F-Zero was a masterpiece series made up of enthralling, challenging, physics-defying, incredibly stylish, fast-as-fuck racing games. It didn't matter how skillful of a player you were or whether you're playing it on the Super Nintendo or the GameCube, F-Zero was one of the only Nintendo series that ever dared to push you out of your comfort zone. While other racing games became boring, glorified time trials while in first place, F-Zero kept you on your toes no matter what position you were in. While other racing games would be content with using items to mask their mediocre racing mechanics, F-Zero challenged players to focus on the racetracks and hone their racing abilities. While other racing games kept things simple to appeal to wider audiences, F-Zero increased their game complexity to push their racing mechanics to their absolute limits. As a fan of F-Zero, I can confidently say that we'll never see another racing series like this ever again. So with all that said, I'd like to spend some time talking about the life of F-Zero, highlighting some of their accomplishments, the major events throughout their life, my own personal fond memories of the series, and their inevitable cause of death. F-Zero was born on November 21st, 1990 in Japan and was first released on the Super Famicom as a launch title for the system alongside Super Mario World. The setting of the game takes place in 2560, where intergalactic multi-billionaires who earn their wealth through interplanetary trade devised a plan to create an entirely new form of entertainment by replicating the old school F-1 races held on Earth and expanding it across the galaxy. In this new Grand Prix, racers would ride in hovercrafts floating one foot off the ground using Super super magnetic technology, and the race courses would be designed with obstacles and traps in mind. In due time, the Grand Prix itself almost became a rite of passage, where winners of the Grand Prix were lauded as the highest honor you could be bestowed upon in the universe, and this new F1-style Grand Prix was later simply called F-Zero. The gameplay was very similar to your standard racing games with a throttle and brake button, but the hovercrafts and the magnetic tracks provided some pretty unique experiences. You can shift your weight to the left or right, which allows you to strafe with the hovercraft. You can cut tight corners by turning and strafing at the same time. You can point the nose of the hovercraft forward or back in the air to increase or decrease your jump flight distance, and you can also get access to a super jet turbo boost after completing a lap. The game featured four racers. You can choose to play as either Captain Falcon, Dr. Stewart, Pico, or Samurai Goro, and each racer had their own unique hovercraft with various stats that affected their speed, acceleration, hovercraft health, and handling. Much like the lore of F-Zero, the goal of the Grand Prix wasn't necessarily to get to first place and accrue the most points, but rather to just survive and make it to the end in one piece. The race courses were littered with rough terrain, landmines, environmental hazards, magnets that will pull your hovercraft off the track, slip zones that will block your magnetic grip and cause you to slip out, and tons of boosts and jump plates to cross over dangerous gaps. As you race through the track, your hovercraft would take damage when you hit obstacles, and if you completely depleted your health bar, you would instantly retire from the race and could only continue if you had additional lives. Yeah, this was a racing game that had lives, that's how you know this shit was fucked up. Meanwhile, falling off the track was an instant death. Okay, this wasn't your baby ass Mario Kart game, okay? Lakitu wouldn't come save your ass if you fell off. Now, what's really funny about this was that F-Zero canonically did have a Lakitu system that could pick you up and save you from a fall, but it was only used as a penalty when you took an unintended massive shortcut. So in F-Zero lore, if you strategically take a massive jump to get ahead to first place and avoid an intentionally placed massive landmine field, the owners of the Grand Prix will pick you up and carry you back in front of the landmine field to keep the race exciting. But if you fail an intended jump on the race, course and you fall off and die, well that's too bad, you should have made the jump. Yeah, we have the technology to save you from dying, but we're not going to use it. Fuck you, welcome to F-Zero. Now, Nintendo intended F-Zero to be a game that highlighted the Super Nintendo's new rendering technique in which the background sprites could be scaled and rotated, allowing the typically 2D console to create pseudo 3D graphics by manipulating the perspectives of the sprites in real time. This rendering technique is called mode 
Mode 7. It was truly an innovative technology that allowed the Super Nintendo to play sprite-based games in a new dimension, and F-Zero was on the cutting edge of realistic graphics with its shitty, fake 3D. However, with all that said, F-Zero was arguably one of the better ones to play. F-Zero created an optimal 30 degree downward view from the horizon where the racetrack and the other racers take up almost the majority of the screen. It was a rare instance of Mode 7 technology where you could actually see turns on the track coming up ahead and you could accurately judge and react to when to make those turns and avoid other racers without having to flash arrows on the screen every five fucking seconds or wasting 50% of the screen with a user useless minimap or a giant elaborate background you don't give a fuck about. F-Zero was one of the rare Mode 7 racers where you could haul ass 500 miles an hour and cut corners with absolute precision, and it was one of the most adrenaline rushing, enthralling experiences you could have if you knew how to play. You see, every F-Zero game has very different nuanced methods for controlling the hovercrafts at top speeds, and in order to have the most fun, F-Zero games basically required you to learn certain techniques. The single trick with the original F-Zero that makes it much more playable is to strafe into the turn without accelerating to maintain your magnetic grip, which allows you to turn more tightly and preserve most of your speed after the turn. And the second you figure this out, the game suddenly becomes extremely playable and really fun. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Wow, Sam, you must be a freaking F-Zero god. How did you figure out this insanely hidden turning tech? Are you some kind of F-Zero speedrunner? Well, yes, I am. This is actually a very complicated trick the F-Zero speedrunners call the Sammy Slammer. I humbly named it after myself, of course, being the F-Zero master who discovered this broken tech. In fact, I was so good at this game, I cemented myself into the annals of history for fucking this game in the ass so hard with the goddamn Sammy Slammer. Oh, wait, never mind. It's in the fucking game manual. Remember that thing you would read on the way home after buying the game? Well, believe it or not, they actually tell you how to play the game in that thing, and you were supposed to read it. Like, what? What? Captain Falcon gives you all the tips and tricks at the end of the manual. The Sammy Slammer is literally right there. Isn't that crazy? Anyways, the original F-Zero was awesome. It was one of the best case uses for Mode 7 on the SNES. It aged pretty well, and it quickly established F-Zero as the new mainline racing series from Nintendo. In fact, Nintendo seemed to have taken pride in F-Zero's success that they continued to use the series as a test subject for cutting-edge technology for many years to follow, especially with projects exclusive to Japan. In the mid-90s, Nintendo partnered with Sento Giga to create a satellite modem peripheral for the Super Famicom called the Satellaview, and two sequels to F-Zero were released exclusively for this system add-on called BS F-Zero Grand Prix 1 and BS F-Zero Grand Prix 2. Now, if you haven't heard about these games, Games and the history of the Satella view or how it works, this explanation will probably be the most confusing shit you've ever heard. In short, the Satella view was an add-on that you could attach to the bottom of your Super Famicom that would allow the system to download satellite broadcast data. What kind of data was that? Well, apparently all sorts of shit. You could view Sento Giga's radio broadcasts like the Tide of Sound broadcasts, you can view magazines like Famitsu, Nintendo Power, and special newsletters, and in F-Zero's case, you can download Soundlink games. So... What the fuck is a Soundlink game? Well, the CEOs at Nintendo were smoking crack cocaine going fucking bonkers at their Japanese headquarters. They're just like, oh shit, we just bought this failing radio company for no fucking reason. Let's just uh, make a video game with the radio satellites. We'll make radio video games. It's like, what? Okay, dude, imagine this shit. We take Zelda on the NES. We radio broadcast a live actor pretending to be the old man through satellite radio. We remake the whole game with voice acting and live orchestrated music. The old man does random thunder strikes at the enemies and we sync the game on a timer and you get one hour to beat the radio video game broken up into multiple parts listening weekly through the radio meanwhile we make them buy a satellite tuner and subscription fee to this teleview to listen to the radio parts of the radio video game and we rig the fucking game so they can't even beat it until the last 15 minutes the very last broadcast we make all the subscription revenue easy fucking money what do we call this shit Woo! soundlink games what? Okay, so I spent an extremely long time researching the Satella view, trying to piece together what the fuck this shit was, but I think I have a good idea. Essentially, Nintendo would take their existing games and restructure them in such a way that they could be synced in real time with a Cento Giga radio broadcast, allowing their games to be enhanced with CD-like audio quality and live commentators. 
This was accomplished by programming the Soundlink games with a live in-game timer that the radio broadcast could plan for ahead of time in order to play back the correct audio. For BSF Zero Grand Prix's case, the radio broadcast would play updated and remixed music, mostly taken from the 1992 jazz album, and live commentators on the broadcast would act in character as the announcers for the Grand Prix. Of course, with all the audio being synced with a live radio broadcast, players were only allowed to access and play BSF Zero Grand Prix during specific times of the day, with four cups being broken up into four separate radio broadcasts that would air in weekly installments almost like a live in-game event. To access the Soundlink game while the broadcast is airing, players would have to use the BSX game cartridge that was included with the Satellaview in order to temporarily download the game data onto an 8 megabyte memory pack that would be inserted on top of the BSX game cartridge. The BSX game features a city created in a graphical art style similar to Earthbound, and players would control a custom avatar and travel between buildings to interact with and download different kinds of satellite data, with BSX itself essentially just being a glorified menu that allows you to interact with all the Satellaview features. Once the radio broadcast for BSF Zero Grand Prix went live, players could then access the memory pack data they downloaded to actually play the game. During gameplay, players would perform practice runs on all five tracks in the cup for exactly three minutes each, and then after the practice run is finished, players would then be able to race against computer players in the proper Grand Prix mode for exactly six minutes on each track. Outside of the Soundlink features, the only major difference with this game was that you could race with four brand new vehicles, as well as four new racetracks spread out between the four cups. BSF Zero Grand Prix 2 was a sequel Soundlink game that functioned in the exact same way. Only two weeks of Soundlink events were ever broadcasted for the sequel, with the later cups in the game being cancelled and never seeing the light of day. There was also an offline practice mode that was available for players who could practice five courses anytime they wanted. Now, due to the nature of these Soundlink games, a lot of the data and information about them has mostly been lost to time, which is probably why I never knew these things even existed. However, I suppose since both of these F-Zero Soundlink games are essentially remixed versions of the original SNES game, they weren't that important in the grand scheme of things. Honestly, I normally would have glossed over these Soundlink games for literally any other Nintendo series, but since F-Zero has lived such a tragically short life and there aren't that many games to begin with, these incredibly obscure sequels that were exclusively released in Japan for the fucking Satellaview are now noteworthy things I have to talk about, which is kinda sad. Meanwhile, back in the rest of the world, we're all just sitting around just like, oh man, F-Zero was pretty fun eight years ago, where's the sequel? Luckily, despite Nintendo's drug-fueled lunacy working on radio video games, they were also working on an actual sequel to F-Zero on the Nintendo 64 called F-Zero X, which was released worldwide in 1998. Now, the original F-Zero was a standout racing game that was pretty unique for a SNES Mode 7 racer, but F-Zero X truly established what made F-Zero F-Zero Special. With the advent of actual 3D graphics, F-Zero X was able to push the futuristic racing theme to its fullest potential by massively increasing the complexity of the racetracks. Many courses featured large loops, gravity-defying upside-down inversions, tunnel and pipe sections where you ride on all sides of the track, much larger and riskier jumps, half-pipe sections with no guardrails, and of course, all the same kinds of obstacles and traps from the original game. Meanwhile, the new method method for boosting in F-Zero X pushed players to their absolute limits. Instead of getting one super boost after each lap that you could only consume once, you now have the ability to use a shorter boost after completing the first lap by consuming a small percentage of your hovercraft's health. This single change to boosting created a massive risk and reward factor that made F-Zero X extremely fun. You can use consecutive short boosts to quickly gain and stack massive amounts of speed to get ahead and maintain your position, but doing so drastically lowered your health and greatly increased the risk of crashing into a wall and instantly dying. So figuring out the perfect balance for using the most boost possible without killing yourself was the most important aspect of F-Zero X. Another major change to F-Zero X was 
the way players could approach and corner turns. This time around, players didn't lose their magnetic grip accelerating through a turn, but you now have the ability to either lean into a turn to perform a slide turn or to lean in the opposite direction to perform a drift turn. Slide turns were your standard turn from the original game where you lean into a corner to take the turn tighter, but a drift turn would force the hovercraft to lose its magnetic grip in order to rotate the hovercraft and possibly turn even tighter. And depending on the stats of your hovercraft, some of these techniques were more useful than others. For example, if you have a vehicle that has high top speed at the cost of low acceleration, losing your magnetic grip and drift turning would basically cause you to lose a massive amount of speed and barely manage to turn at all. So using the control stick and slide turns were basically your only options. On the other hand, if your vehicle has high acceleration with a low top speed, you would actually be able to utilize the drift turn to effectively corner hairpin turns and gain speed at the same time, with the downside being that you would go slower on straightaways. Because of this new game mechanic, players could now view a mini map of the race course ahead of time and alter their vehicle engine settings to take advantage of these techniques when necessary. Now, while this was a really cool system, these new methods for turning were probably the only frustrating aspect of F-Zero X. The main problem I personally had was that making sudden adjustments with the control stick could cause your hovercraft to lose grip and enter a drift turn state unintentionally. So if you were prioritizing top speed when this happened, you basically just slid out, lost most of your speed, and most likely crashed straight into a wall. Of course, there's definitely a lot of skill and finesse required when turning with the control stick that will mitigate this from happening, but it's still a pretty massive penalty in comparison to the first game. Regardless of this system, each pilot in F-Zero X still had personal hovercrafts with their own unique stats, with the body, boost, and grip now being simplified from rank E to A, representing worst to best stats respectively. And although all of this can feel a bit complicated to learn in tandem with the new engine settings, it mainly just comes down to your own personal preference. Speaking of the roster, F-Zero X added 26 new pilots you could play as alongside the four OG racers from the SNES game, meaning all 30 positions in the Grand Prix were now represented with unique pilots and hovercrafts. The F-Zero lore surrounding these new characters on the roster was also fucking insane. You got your standard human characters and aliens from distant planets, but now we also got cyborgs and superheroes and monkeys. We got a literal incarnation of evil. We got a Batman supervillain who also created an evil clone of Captain Falcon. We got goofy ass Nintendo Easter eggs like James McCloud riding a goddamn Arwing hovercraft. And we got a fucking skeleton who used black magic and science to reincarnate themselves back to life just to race an F-Zero. Like, this shit was fucking nuts. The new lore surrounding F-Zero X also resulted in rule changes for the F-Zero X Grand Prix, where pilots were awarded points at the end of each race depending on their position, and whoever got the most points at the end of the cup won. To shake things up this time around, CPU pilots who have accrued the most points during the cup were given a rival icon, and players were now incentivized to kill them. This could be accomplished by attacking their vehicles directly with a side attack to crash them into a wall, or by using a spin attack and pushing them off the race course, once again highlighting the brutality of F-Zero. Now, you might think I'm playing up how barbaric and brutal F-Zero was, but F-Zero X did also add the new death race mode where the goal was to kill everyone, so I guess it could go either way. So with all that said, F-Zero X was fucking awesome. It took the concept of the original game and brought it into the actual third dimension with tons of new features, and while the graphics have aged terribly, Nintendo prioritized running the game at 60 frames per second making the gameplay age like fine wine. By the beginning of the 2000s, the F-Zero series was absolutely killing it. The original F-Zero was a fucking classic, F-Zero X upped the ante with superior gameplay, and those Soundlink games were a result of a rough coke field binge, but no one outside Japan knew what that was, no one knew what happened, and now Nintendo was on the straight and narrow, and nothing could possibly go wrong. Meanwhile, the Nintendo CEOs were smoking crystal meth going absolutely ape shit at their Japanese headquarters. They're just like, F-Zero X was fucking nuts, bro! We gotta put the Soundlink radio technology into F-Zero X, make it a radio video game again! Meanwhile, Sento Gigas just discontinued their broadcast, it's all going to shit, they're going bankrupt, so now Nintendo is like, whatever, dude, those guys fucking suck dick anyways, we don't need the radio, we got the 64DD! So... What the fuck? 
fuck is the 64DD? Well, just like the Satella view, the 64DD was a peripheral add-on for the Nintendo 64 that was once again exclusive to Japan. It attached to the bottom of the Nintendo 64 and utilized 64 megabyte floppy disks to temporarily download and save data, much like the same functionality of the BSX cartridge for the Satella view. The 64DD was released in December 1999, but was effectively discontinued near the end of the following year as the GameCube was already just around the corner and sales for the add-on were incredibly poor. In this incredibly long lifespan of a couple of months, Nintendo released 10 whole games for the 64DD, and one of them was the F-Zero X Expansion Kit. This game was basically exactly what it sounds like. By inserting the F-Zero X Expansion Kit into the 64DD while using the F-Zero X game cartridge, players could access additional content for the game. The expansion kit included two new Grand Prix Cups with 12 new tracks, an updated stereophonic soundtrack, as well well as a machine editor and a track editor. The machine editor involved putting together pre-existing parts with corresponding stats in order to create a unique hovercraft, which was pretty straightforward and simple to understand. The track editor was surprisingly much more complicated. It allowed users to create F-Zero racetracks in such high detail that supposedly the same tool that the developers used themselves. Overall, the expansion kit was basically F-Zero X with some more stuff. Meanwhile, back in the rest of the world, the 64DD didn't even come out, no one knew what the fuck that was, it's 2001, we got two F-Zero games, they were pretty good, and now Nintendo decided to release a third game called F-Zero Maximum Velocity as a launch title for the Game Boy Advance. Now, this game was a pivotal turning point in the series, because this was when F-Zero stopped being developed by Nintendo EAD, and third-party studios were hired out by Nintendo to help pick up the slack. For F-Zero Maximum Velocity, Nintendo tasked their Japanese subsidiary company, ND Cube, to help create the game, which was mainly made up of ex-Hudson Soft employees. Story-wise, the game takes place 25 years after the original SNES game and featured an entirely new cast of pilots, with the OG racers from the first game being lauded as legendary racers of the past. Right off the bat, one of my gripes with this game was that the new cast of pilots weren't nearly as interesting as the previous games, and the entire roster basically gave off RC Cola vibes. The gameplay was very reminiscent of the original SNES game and featured pretty much the exact same style of graphics, boost mechanics, and Grand Prix structure. But one of the most notable differences was that the turning mechanics have been slightly altered. This time around, the most efficient way to corner a turn while maintaining your speed was to repeatedly tap the throttle button. For whatever reason, when you tap the throttle off and on, it causes the hovercraft to reset some of its horizontal momentum, and it gives the hovercraft an incredibly short nudge forward when you press the throttle, so the most efficient way to maintain your grip at top speeds was to mash the A button through every single turn. Overall, it was a pretty fun game to play, but having to constantly mash the A button on sharp turns was honestly really annoying, and I would have much preferred how it worked in the first game. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Wow, Sam, just because you're an epic F-Zero god who's using some crazy speedrunner tech unbeknownst to the masses, it doesn't mean that the game is bad because you're forced to mash buttons at the top 0.0 one percentile of play, not everyone could invent the Sammy Slammer like you did back in the day. Well, believe it or not, that's exactly what I thought when I was playing the game. I was like, oh shit, if you mash the A button, you maintain your grip while going fast as fuck. I'm calling this move the Sammy Spammer because you spam the throttle. However, despite my ambitious discoveries and all the accolades and sexy females I have acquired with my speedrunning prowess, the Sammy Spammer was actually an intended gameplay mechanic the whole time. You know why I know that? You you know why I fucking know that? Because it's in the fucking game manual. Oh, shit. That's right. You thought I didn't read that shit, but I did. The Sammy Spammer turning technique was called Blast Turns. They knew what they were doing. It's an intentional gameplay mechanic made for this game, and I don't like it. It's fucking annoying. Another small gripe I had with this game was that the race courses were just absolutely littered with NPC random ass pedestrian hovercrafts that were essentially designed to just be a fucking nuisance. Now, the first game also had the same mechanic, and it's sort of a weird trend amongst older racing games that's kind of died out, but it's a major problem with maximum velocity specifically. Like, these motherfuckers will just be on the race course going 10 miles an hour stacked up against each other and intentionally merging into you while you're passing. It's so fucking annoying. 
Overall, F-Zero Maximum Velocity was a pretty decent game for a handheld system, but it's definitely the weakest game in the series. The Mode 7 graphics were pretty dated at this point, it obviously wasn't as cutting edge as the games on console were during the time, and let's be honest here, I mean, it didn't even have Captain Falcon. Like, what the fuck? Luckily, none of this actually mattered, as F-Zero was about to come out with their greatest game yet, because a couple years later, in 2003, Nintendo released F-Zero GX on the GameCube. Nintendo hired Sega's Amusement Vision to develop F-Zero GX, and this was one of the first major collaborations between both companies after Sega pivoted away from creating consoles and became a third-party studio. Now, in most cases, when Nintendo hired an outside company to pick up their slack, the quality of those games were usually not as good, and the resulting subpar games would slowly kill off the enthusiasm for the series over time. But F-Zero GX was the rare exception where the third-party developers Nintendo hired out were actually actually more competent than Nintendo. Amusement Vision was headed by Toshihiro Nagoshi, who created Daytona USA and Super Monkey Ball, and the company later reorganized to become New Entertainment R&D and went on to create the entire Yakuza franchise. So Nintendo definitely landed on some fucking masterclass talent. Meanwhile, the fundamental mechanics for F-Zero GX were already established by Nintendo with F-Zero X, so all Sega had to do was use all their skills to build off F-Zero X and push it to the next level, which they did tenfold. In short, F-Zero GX was not only the best F-Zero game in the series, but it's the best racing game of all time. All fucking time. Unlike every previous F-Zero game that had a couple of weird little quirks to maintain magnetic grip or figuring out how to actually corner turns, F-Zero GX just intuitively worked. The controls for this game were fucking flawless. You don't have to mess with the throttle going through turns, you don't have to read the fucking game manual to figure out some obscure, minute gameplay mechanic that sucked ass, it immediately felt amazing to play right off the bat. Even if you were completely terrible at F-Zero, you could pick this game up for the very first time and play it on the lowest difficulty setting and have an absolute blast. First and foremost, they fixed the shitty drift turns from F-Zero X by actually allowing you to use them with a top speed engine configuration without Akira sliding straight into a fucking wall. So with this one and only change, you can just take F-Zero X and throw it in the fucking trash. I mean, it's still a good game, but like, come on, bro. Meanwhile, the rest of this game just fucking slapped. The controls were smooth as eggs. The boosts went fast as fuck. The graphics were goddamn amazing. It had the same awesome cast of pilots and hovercrafts from F-Zero X with tons of extra unlockable content. And it even had the machine customization features from the expansion kit. But the most notable aspect of F-Zero GX I personally enjoyed the most was the god-tier soundtrack Sega created for this game that dynamically changes phases for each lap of the race. A race would start with some strong guitar riffs and then transition to an epic guitar solo once you unlocked boost power on the second lap, and then transition again to a 200 BPM futuristic drum and bass beat for the final lap. Like, this soundtrack was so fucking good! F-Zero GX also included an entirely new story mode with nine chapters, and although that may sound really short, it was honestly so obscenely difficult that almost no one ever beat it. Like, whose idea was it to have the final boss fight be in chapter 2. Like, fucking come on, bro, that shit was fucking impossible. Lore-wise, the story mode itself wasn't all that interesting. It was mainly just a foundation for creating some unique challenges, but it was still pretty cool seeing the CG cutscenes and getting a new glimpse of the F-Zero universe. Besides that, there weren't that many major mechanical differences between F-Zero X and F-Zero GX because Sega basically took F-Zero X and just made it better in every single way. Of course, this wouldn't be an F-Zero game without Nintendo and incorporating some technological gimmick they designed in a drug-fueled haze. So with F-Zero GX's release, Nintendo and Sega also teamed up with Namco to release F-Zero AX, which was the arcade version. F-Zero AX featured 10 unique pilots alongside the OG4 racers, as well as a new set of six racetracks. The gameplay was incredibly similar to the GX version, although the physics of the game and the controls were slightly altered to accommodate for the arcade cabinet setup. The cabinet itself featured a steering wheel with two pedals at the bottom, with the wheel featuring a giant blue button in the middle used for boosts, and two yellow paddles on both sides to perform strafing, slide turns, and side and spin attacks. The most notable change to the game was that drift turns were performed by slightly braking before a turn like you would in a traditional racing game, which I assume was done to be more intuitive to general audiences. The arcade cabinets also came in three different variants. One was the regular sit-down model, one 
was the deluxe model shaped like the Blue Falcon that utilized a hydraulic tilting seat to simulate movement in the cockpit, and there was a hyper deluxe cabinet called the F-Zero Monster Ride that utilized a suspended machine and three servo motors to simulate 3D movement on the racetrack. The solo racing mode had players race through a single course against 29 CPUs, and each track featured different numbers of laps depending on the length of the course. And if there were multiple cabinets connected together, three other players also had the option to join in to open up versus play. Now, the main gimmick of F-Zero AX was that players could bring their GameCube memory card and insert it into the F-Zero AX cabinet in order to use their unique custom machines in F-Zero AX, as well as being able to unlock F-Zero AX content that you could bring back into F-Zero GX. This content included the new pilots, some arcade exclusive machine parts, and six exclusive AX tracks that would become the AX Cup. Surprisingly, while it may seem like this content was only available to those who had access to the F-Zero AX cabinets, you can actually unlock all the AX content in F-Zero GX by itself. But the catch was that it was so fucking hard that most players never did it. To unlock the AX Cup in F-Zero GX alone, players have to complete all the Grand Prix on Master Mode, which I finally completed myself after playing the game for over 10 years, and you can unlock the AX exclusive machine parts and pilots by beating the story mode chapters on their hardest difficulties, which I have never attempted and will never do. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ, if you get past chapter two on normal difficulty, you were a fucking F-Zero God. That story mode was fucked up. So with all that said, unless you're one of the greatest players of all time, tracking down an F-Zero AX arcade cabinet is basically the only legitimate way to unlock this stuff. So good luck with that shit. Have fun traveling halfway across the country to whatever rundown movie theater or you can find that has one of these things so you can unlock fucking Dai Sangen from the planet Shinar. Now, for me personally, there's already 30 of these motherfuckers on the roster and I only use like two of them. Maybe one day I'll finally get bored of replaying the Grand Prix mode and I'll actually attempt the harder story mode missions to legitimately unlock Phoenix, the time-traveling space detective, but I'm good for now. So with all that said, F-Zero GX aged incredibly well, the gameplay was fucking godlike, no other futuristic racing game has ever topped it, it's way more fun to play than all the realistically simulated Forza bullshit, this game alone carried the entire series on its back, and F-Zero was on top of the fucking world just absolutely killing it. But, there was one problem, a problem that quickly resulted in the immediate death of the series. You see, while F-Zero GX received tons of critical acclaim and was widely considered to be one of the best racing games ever made, even to this day, the series overall had only received mild success financially, which was why Nintendo EAD stopped developing these games back in 2001. In fact, F-Zero GX even sold less than F-Zero Maximum Velocity on the Game Boy Advance, which sold less than F-Zero X on the Nintendo 64, which sold less than F-Zero on the SNES. No matter how you looked at it, the popularity of F-Zero was on a continuative downturn with every single release and the writing was on the wall. Because of this, Nintendo needed to immediately course correct and come up with an innovative plan that would reinvigorate the series in a brand new way. So they did what they do best and decided to smoke crack. The CEOs of Nintendo went fucking oonga boonga apeshit at their Japanese headquarters, devising the next cutting edge technology they could slap onto F-Zero. But despite their best efforts, their drug-fueled machinations failed to manifest, and it appeared like F-Zero would be lost forever. However, at a last ditch effort, Nintendo pulled out the big guns, and Shigeru Innovation Miyamoto came to the rescue to provide his unique insight with his brilliant Willy Wonka-esque brain. He was like, oh shit, how about instead of using a control stick, you instead control an AR augmented steering wheel projected onto the ground and you activate boost power by slapping your ass. We'll create a mechanical peripheral that attaches to your fucking TV that simulates movement on the racetrack by shaking and moving the TV in real time. That's a unique experience that no one has ever seen before, so it must be good. We can even package the game with F-Zero scratch and sniff stickers so you can smell the future. Meanwhile, the one normal CEO who didn't OD off crystal tar heroin was just like, hey, how about we do online play. That would be pretty innovative. We haven't done that yet.
We're making an F-Zero anime! Is this shit for fucking real? F-Zero GP Legend was a 51 episode anime that began to air on TV Tokyo in Japan in 2003. The story was non-canon and took place in a reboot universe about 300 years prior to the original games, but it did feature a similar universe with the same characters from the video games. On top of an anime release, Nintendo also released an anime tie-in game with the same name on the Game Boy Advance about a month or so after the anime aired on TV Tokyo, and they quickly followed this up with a sequel anime tie-in game called F-Zero Climax that was released after the series finale aired in 2004. These three projects, alongside F-Zero GX, which released a couple months prior, were essentially Nintendo's final Hail Mary to revive F-Zero and bring it back into the spotlight. So with nothing to lose, Nintendo released everything within a year, enacted their worldwide F-Zero media blitzkrieg, and clenched their teeth, waiting to see if the F-Zero brand would finally take off again and gain a second wind. So, did it work? Well, no, obviously not. But in the spirit of F-Zero, I figured we should reflect on the final moments of F-Zero's hospice care and talk about the fond memories we had up until the bitter end. Now, I know this is going to be heavy for some people, but there's a lot to unpack here within this very short time frame. So let's start off just talking about each project individually, starting with F-Zero GP Legend, the anime. Now, talking about anime is a bit out of my wheel house and it's not something I've ever done before. However, I do think F-Zero GP Legend played a pretty significant role in F-Zero's final moments on Earth, so I do think it's worth talking about. After all, this anime was unique in the fact that it was the key source material directly linked to the last two games in the series, so while I would normally gloss over this kind of stuff, it's surprisingly relevant to the conversation. So. Is F-Zero GP Legend a good anime? Well, for the most part, it's a pretty standard anime from 2003, and I wouldn't exactly recommend it to anyone, but as a pure F-Zero fanservice show, it does a pretty good job. The one major aspect of the anime that might throw off F-Zero fans is that the main character isn't Captain Falcon, but rather a new pilot exclusive to the anime named Ryu Suzaku, whose main purpose is to essentially be a sort of self-insert fish-out-of-water character that interacts with the F-Zero universe with fresh eyes. Now, F-Zero GP Legend actually accomplishes this in a pretty unintentionally funny way. You see, Ryu Suzaku is actually a police detective F-1 racer from New York City in 2051, but after chasing down a notorious criminal named Zoda, he gets killed during the chase and is unexpectedly cryogenically frozen and is awakened by the mobile task force 150 years into the future, with the New York City of the past now being known as Mute City. Meanwhile, Zoda Zoda was also cryogenically frozen at the same time and also awakened 150 years into the future as well by an evil criminal organization known as the Dark Million. So after Ryu learns that Zoda is still alive, this motivates him to team up with the Mobile Task Force and get his revenge. Much like the video game lore, the Dark Million and other criminal organizations race in the F-Zero Grand Prix in order to win the prize money to fund their nefarious purposes. So the Mobile Task Force's goal is to enter the F-Zero Grand Prix as a counterinsurgency operation to win the prize money for themselves and take it away from the bad guys. And this was basically the entire foundation for the show. As the story progresses, Ryu gets introduced to the world of F-Zero, learns how to become a better pilot working with the mobile task force, and he meets and interacts with all the other pilots on the F-Zero GX roster. To the show's credit, it does an amazing job pleasing F-Zero fans by serving up tons of remix game music, as well as crafting tons of episodes that revolve around singular pilots that gives all the characters on the roster a decent amount of screen time and introduces all their backstories. There's a Samurai Goro episode, there's a Kate Allen episode, there's a Blood Falcon episode, and so on and so forth. There's also an incredibly viral moment during the final episode that you've probably seen before, where Captain Falcon defeats Black Shadow by Falcon punching the shit out of him and blowing up the entire universe, which honestly is the hype as shit. The anime's existence was worth it for that moment alone. So with everything I've seen, I can confidently say that F-Zero GP Legend was a decent show for what it set out to do, and it's honestly not that bad. But 
That's not telling the full story for how things inevitably turned out. After all, F-Zero GP Legend wasn't just a passion project for the fans. Its ulterior purpose was to promote the F-Zero brand while also being a marketing vector for the anime tying games. So when we're examining the show under those circumstances, it ends up being a very questionable business decision. Of course, I'm definitely not qualified to talk about the proper marketing and business strategies they could have implemented during the time to save F-Zero. But it doesn't take a genius to realize how financially risky this was when comparing it to much more successful video game adaptations like Pokemon. Now, this may seem like a very unfair comparison, but it actually isn't, because after watching both animes, I discovered that Pokemon is word for word, bar for bar, the exact same show. Both animes have a self-insert main protagonist who are not canon in the video games, who both go out on a new adventure and experience their own respective in-game universes, by interacting with the actual in-canon characters and places, both shows are pretty equal to each other as far as their writing and animation quality is concerned, and both shows even serve the same exact purpose of promoting a video game brand. However, despite these extreme similarities, one show was clearly vastly more popular, so why was that the case? Well, obviously, the reason Pokemon was more popular was because Pokemon was more popular. The anime aired on TV during Pokemon's absolute peak in popularity, and because the video games were already immensely successful on their own, an anime adaptation made perfect sense. Meanwhile, F-Zero GP Legend was released as the F-Zero series was going into a massive decline. Not only was this arguably the worst time to branch out into other mediums, but now they're also depending on the anime to boost the popularity of their video games, which was clearly putting the cart before the horse. Overall, this anime just felt like a fiscally irresponsible marketing venture and putting it in the position where it also had to help promote two anime tie-in games that would go on to determine the entire future of the franchise was fucking insane. Especially for a series that was already declining in popularity. So with all that said, F-Zero GP Legend was basically set up to eat shit. It was a show that was almost guaranteed to never meet the wild expectations they had planned for it and the F-Zero Media Blitzkrieg that Nintendo was planning was already off to a bad start. Still, despite this obvious setback, it's not like the anime was the only thing keeping things afloat. After all, F-Zero GX just came out a couple months prior, and that game was fucking awesome, and now there's also two GBA games being released that might be just as good. So now that we've talked about F-Zero GP Legend, let's talk about F-Zero GP Legend for the Game Boy Advance. Nintendo hired the Japanese company Suzak to develop this game, and as the name suggests, it closely followed the established universe from the anime. While it's once again another Mode 7 F-Zero game, it did feature the modern mechanics introduced in F-Zero X, which made the gameplay so much better. You had the F-Zero X boost system, you had access to side attacks to help corner turns more effectively, and the hovercraft controls didn't require you to constantly mess with the throttle to perform blast turns, or require you to read the fucking game manual to learn some unintuitive gameplay mechanic. The story mode this time featured five missions for eight pilots that tell their perspective in the overarching story, which plot-wise was about as simple and bare bones as F-Zero GX was. But you also didn't instantly fight the final boss in Chapter 2, so I suppose that was an improvement. The most unique new mode for this game was Zero Test, where players would be challenged to use a specific pilot and complete a small portion of a racetrack within the allotted time. Overall, the addition of the modern mechanics greatly enhanced the experience, and F-Zero GP Legend was easily the best Mode 7 F-Zero game ever released. Although, that's not really saying much. After all, the graphical art style was very old at this point, and there was already a very similar F-Zero Game Boy Advance game that came out a couple of years ago, so despite the awesome improvements this game brought to the table and how fun it was, it's ultimately just more of the same. Adding to the Mode 7 F-Zero pile once again was F-Zero Climax, which was also developed by Suzak and was also released on the Game Boy Advance in 2004. The major gameplay change with F-Zero Climax was that it featured a combined boost system from the original F-Zero and F-Zero X. Players could still unlock boost power after completing the first lap as was standard in F-Zero X, but they can also unlock a stocked boost after completing each lap that activated Boost Fire, which was a longer, singular use boost similar to the first game. For context, 
the boost fire mechanic actually originates from the anime, and it's introduced in the later episodes once Captain Falcon teaches Ryu how to use it. In the show, they sort of do a spin attack to activate it, and the hovercraft turns into a spinning super boost that they use whenever they need to go fast as fuck. So it's basically like the F-Zero equivalent to going Super Saiyan. Other notable modes were the new survival mode, which essentially functioned as the story mode with a new coat of paint, and they also added a track editor that players could use to create and save levels. Besides that, it was basically a slightly expanded reskin of F-Zero GP Legend. There were some incredibly minor changes like the new boosting system and the track editor and the Grand Prix announcer never being able to shut the fuck up, but for the average consumer, both of these games were indiscernible from each other. At the end of the day, it was just another F-Zero Mode 7 Game Boy Advance game that they shit out as fast as possible solely to cross-promote it with the anime. Like, the fact that Nintendo was pushing one tie-in game right after releasing an F-Zero game on the same handheld a couple of years prior was already pushing it. But now they were doing two games within a year? That's three fucking Game Boy Advance games! Like, that's borderline suicidal. So with all that said, we now have a complete understanding of these projects, we now know all the pieces in play, and the time finally came for Nintendo to enact their worldwide F-Zero Media Blitzkrieg to save F-Zero. So, how did this all play out? Well, things technically started off with F-Zero GX. They released the game worldwide, and it sold roughly 100,000 copies at its launch in 2003, and it went on to sell roughly 600,000 copies for its entire lifetime on the GameCube. It wasn't exactly the best start for their Grand Master plan, but the game did receive critical acclaim. F-Zero GP Legend then began airing on TV Tokyo in October, and the first GBA tie-in game was also released in Japan a month later. The sales it launched for F-Zero GP Legend in Japan were even worse than F-Zero GX, with roughly only 10,000 copies ever being sold. The game also received slightly worse reviews than F-Zero Maximum Velocity for being a bit derivative, despite being the much better game. Reviews for the anime during the time of its release are incredibly hard to find, and I couldn't find any definitive ratings, but we do know that it continued to air on TV Tokyo for all 51 episodes, and the final episode aired on September 2004. It's unclear whether or not the anime directly hindered the sales of the tie-in game, but overall, the enthusiasm for F-Zero in Japan was at an all-time low. Meanwhile, the English dub of F-Zero GP Legend also began airing on Foxbox in the United States during the same month, and the US version of the game was also planned to be released alongside it a couple of weeks later. And it's at this moment in time where everything started to collapse. After the final episode of the anime aired on TV Tokyo, Tokyo, the Japanese version of F-Zero Climax was released in October 2004, and it sold even less than F-Zero GP Legend with a measly 5,000 copies ever being sold. Japan didn't give a fuck. Now, did it review worse than GP Legend? Well, fuck if I know, the reviewers in Japan didn't even play this shit either. I mean, Jesus Christ, the Nintendo DS was about to launch next month, like who gives a fuck? Meanwhile, despite Foxbox's consistent promotion for the English dub, the anime was already a massive flop in the United States. Everything was on fire, shit was super fucked. However, despite not a single soul watching the English dub, F-Zero GP Legend supposedly sold around 100,000 copies in the United States, but that wasn't nearly enough to salvage the situation. The first 14 episodes of the English dub continued to air to bad ratings until December in 2004 where the show went back into reruns. During this period, Foxbox was rebranded as 4Kids TV in January 2005, with the TV block assumingly being under new management. So when the new episodes of F-Zero GP Legend were set to continue on March 5th, 2005, and the 15th episode continued to be met with abysmal ratings, the rest of the scheduled episodes were immediately cancelled, and the English dub was evaporated from existence. The remaining episodes of the English dub were lost to time, the English English versions of F-Zero Climax were never released, and Nintendo's plans to revive F-Zero completely failed. F-Zero was pronounced dead shortly after. 
Now, when we look back on the life of F-Zero, it's easy to focus on the diminishing sales and the downward trend and the barrage of Game Boy Advance games that no one gave a fuck about. But when I remember F-Zero, I remember the amazing moments I had playing F-Zero GX. I remember the countless hours I spent replaying the game and slowly progressing and getting better. I remember all the amazing music. I think about all the times looking up world record time trials and thinking, wow, how the fuck is that actually possible? Sure, the Falcon Punch was pretty cool. Sure, Super Smash Bros. fans claim to love Captain Falcon but didn't actually play F-Zero when it mattered most. That's fine, I'm not putting the blame on anyone, I'm not petty. F-Zero left behind a legacy of being one of the best racing series of all time with uncompromising difficulty and relentless speed. And even after all these years, there's never been anything quite like it. Rest in peace. So with all that said, that concludes the main portion of the funeral service. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and supporting each other. It's a bit awkward putting together a funeral a decade or so after the fact, and also posting it as a YouTube video, but I guess with the advent of Nintendo Directs, it seems like that's just the way things are progressing. Anyways, I appreciate everyone who's watched so far. I'm sure it would mean a lot to F-Zero knowing that so many of their fans showed up and stayed to watch. So now that we've talked about all the fond memories we've had, I suppose now it's time to continue celebrating the life of F-Zero by heading over to the funeral reception, loosening up a bit, and start talking hella shit. Now, I've seen plenty of video game series die off in their own spectacular ways, but even after a decade of silence, I still haven't been able to move on from F-Zero's death. And I think that mainly comes down to never feeling a sense of closure. I mean, F-Zero GX was only released about a year prior to the series' death. The fact that F-Zero was killed off immediately after releasing one of the greatest racing games of all time was fucking ridiculous, and I feel like we were completely robbed of a bright future where we could have at least seen a couple of more F-Zero games on console. Meanwhile, the clear justification for killing off the series after releasing F-Zero GX was that a bunch of unrelated subpar Game Boy Advance games sold really poorly, which was fucking bullshit. Like, yeah! Obviously, the derivative Mode 7 anime tying games that were built off outdated Super Nintendo graphics that they shit out on the Game Boy Advance solely to release it alongside the anime that got cancelled in the US because no one fucking watched it was going to sell poorly. I mean, even F-Zero Maximum Velocity sold 600,000 copies between Japan and the US by 2005, and that was only released two years prior to the anime tie-in games. Like, people's opinions of F-Zero didn't drastically shift that fast within two fucking years, you dumb fucks! At the end of the day, the extremely poor sales of the anime tie-in games were clearly amplified by the shoddy nature of their releases, and the higher-ups at Nintendo should have taken that into consideration. But instead, it's seems like Nintendo just completely and utterly lost confidence with the series. Now, do I think that F-Zero may be revived from the dead someday and will finally get a proper sequel to F-Zero GX? Well, honestly, I don't know. I'm not a fucking fortune teller who predicts the future. Maybe a new F-Zero game is already in development and it'll come out in the next decade or so, but at the end of the day, this entire video was just a snapshot of the current times, and right now, at this very moment, in 2015, this shit sucks. Anyways, I was trying to think of a positive note to end things on and maybe recommend people to check out F-Zero GX or something, but honestly, talking about F-Zero is just depressing. So, I'm gonna head out. Bitch, I don't care if no one gives a fuck about Pikmin. We're making a goddamn Pikmin game. Suck my fucking dick. Get the fuck out of my office. Stupid ass motherfucker. Check it out, dude. The latest gameplay footage for the new F-Zero game we've been working on just got sent over to us. This game is so innovative, it's gonna blow your fucking mind. What the fuck was that? 
It's a Battle Royale F-Zero game. They'll never see it coming. Oh, uh, okay, that's cool. But I just have to ask for my own personal sanity. Is this game going to have online play? Psh, no, why the fuck would we do that? All the other Battle Royale games already have online multiplayer that's not very innovative. We have to be different and subvert expectations. So that's why we're releasing the same Mode 7 game for the seventh fucking time in a row. That's what everyone wants. If you don't put an online multiplayer into this goddamn F-Zero game, I'm gonna fucking kill you. It's been 20 fucking years. Where's the online play? Fine, we'll put it in. F-Zero 99 is an online multiplayer Battle Royale version of the original F-Zero and was released in 2023 on the Nintendo Switch as a free download through the Nintendo Switch online subscription service. This time around, Nintendo actually developed the game themselves with the help of Nintendo Software Technology, which is their in-house development team based in the United States. The main mode features 99 players racing against each other on a classic F-Zero race course at the same time. Players begin each race by choosing between one of the four classic hovercrafts and voting on the race course before being thrown into a giant starting line and beginning the match. At the start of the race, players enter the race course through a massive section of track that slowly funnels all the players together that then dumps them all straight into the starting line of the selected race course, where all 99 players then have to race against each other for four laps. Since the original game has been transformed into a battle royale, a lot of the core mechanics have been drastically changed. Players have access to the F-Zero X boosting system to gain a competitive edge on other players, and they also added a spin attack that functions more as a self-defense tool that can knock other players away and prevents you from losing health. The most notable addition to the game is the Skyway. By collecting super sparks created by machine collisions, players can fill a super meter and briefly gain access to the Skyway track above to gain a slight boost in speed and to avoid some of the absolute bedlam taking place below. The most interesting aspect of the Skyway is that it slightly deviates from the course below and allows players to sometimes take shortcuts and alternate paths that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Now, while this new mechanic seems completely busted, the most challenging aspects skilled players face aren't the players in the back using the Skyway, but rather avoiding the complete onslaught of obstacles the game will be spawning right in front of you in first place. In order to survive until the end of the race, players in the top positions have to constantly alter their optimal racing lines to avoid hitting all the bumpers. And since most of the top players will be constantly boosting to maintain their position, they will almost always be a couple of hits from death. Players who died early in the race can also sometimes gain control of a blue bumper that they can briefly control for around 30 seconds, and due to the nature of these bumpers, they can be incredibly hard to predict. So with all these mechanics happening all at once, F-099 is by far one of the most clusterfuck racing games I've ever played, even more than Mario Kart Wii. However, despite how nauseating this game looks at a first glance, it's somehow still surprisingly fun. Driving through race courses in massive groups can be pretty daunting for survival, but player on player collisions essentially do almost no damage in comparison to the environmental hazards and obstacles. So as long as you play it safe and leave enough wiggle room for other players, the other racers aren't going to cause too many problems. The game also has a pretty good rival system that pairs you up against other players within your skill rating. So while it can be disappointing to never win first place, you can still feel a little sense of progression by defeating your rivals during your matches and ranking up. There's also no denying that online multiplayer for F-Zero is just fun. Winning first place amongst 98 other real racers is a lot more rewarding than it would be against computer players, pushing real players off the track and blowing them up is very satisfying, and even the simple act of being a blue bumper and knowingly ruining at least one person's day does give you a bit of joy that you wouldn't be able to have otherwise. Ultimately, while F-Zero 099 is the same rehashed Mode 7 racing game that they've released time and time again, the online multiplayer component does completely justify the experience. So with all that said, F-099 is a surprisingly fun experience that came out of nowhere, and I'm glad that Nintendo has finally dusted off the series and actually made something worth playing. But there's still a part of me that feels incredibly unsatisfied.
I mean, not only did Nintendo release yet another Mode 7 F-Zero game that recycles the same SNES graphics we've seen time and time again after 19 fucking years of absolutely nothing, but they also somehow managed to make it an online-only experience that will become completely unplayable in the future. The previous 99 title games that this game was based off of are already famous for their temporary existence, and it doesn't make much of a difference whether Nintendo decides to either take it down themselves or graciously keep it alive and allow the player base to slowly dwindle down to nothing. At the end of the day, F-099 is just bound to become the same kind of unplayable lost media as the Soundlink games of the past and there's really no other way to look at it. I mean, if Nintendo still hasn't released a new F-Zero game by the time F-099 inevitably gets killed off, then that just means we're back to square one and F-Zero will continue being a dead franchise. Meanwhile, Nintendo is like sucking their own dicks and claiming that F-Zero is finally back after all these years, which is technically true, but I don't know why anyone is giving Nintendo praise for releasing a project that's barely meeting the absolute minimum requirements for even being considered a new F-Zero game. I mean, why the fuck do F-Zero fans let Nintendo get away with this shit? Like, F-Zero fans just let everyone trample all over them. Like, we just let Nintendo release the same fucking Mode 7 games over and over again. We just let Super Smash Bros. take Captain Falcon. We let Mario Kart 8 just jack our shit. Shit. We don't even have any fucking games to show for it. We only got F-Zero GX cause Sega made it. And now we're supposed to be happy that we're getting a goddamn free download for a glorified browser game after 19 fucking years of nothing. Like fucking come on. Meanwhile, now that Nintendo has technically released this new Battle Royale F-Zero game that no one fucking asked for, now we all have to play this song and dance where we all just have to fake our excitement like the fucking peasants we are. Like. Oh my god, guys, we all gotta download F-099 and play it all for months because we'll never get an F-Zero game ever again until 2042. Oh, we all gotta prove to Nintendo that F-Zero is popular again. Like, fuck off. Fuck you! Listen, the fact that F-Zero isn't popular is Nintendo's fault. They're the ones who fucked up the series. It's not my responsibility to fake enthusiasm over yet another Mode 7 F-Zero game. If Nintendo genuinely wanted to attempt to revive the series, they would release an actual sequel to F-Zero GX. And if that future game underperformed or sold badly, then at least we could say that they gave it an honest chance and we could finally move on with our lives. But until that day comes, I'm not letting Nintendo off the hook with the same Mode 7 bullshit we've been getting for the past 30 30 years. Like, bitch, I know you made F-Zero X. You know how to make games in 3D. Just make a fucking 3D F-Zero game. How hard is that? So as far as I'm concerned, the series as we knew it is still very much dead, and while F-Zero 99 is technically a new F-Zero game, it will also eventually die. So with all that said, rest in peace F-Zero and R.I.P. F-Zero 99. They ain't dead, but for when they die, cause you know it's coming up. <laughs>